Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Equine Business Network's live webcast on ensuring proper documentation to enable employment on horse operations. Please remember that you can find additional information on tonight's topic in the course site, including the recording of tonight's webcast, a PDF version of the presentation, a decision-making tool exercise, and additional resources. The presenters this evening include Roger McOwen and Erica Eckley. Roger is a professor in agricultural law in the Department of Agricultural Education and Studies at Iowa State University. He is also the director of the Center for Agricultural Law and Taxation. He is a member of the Iowa and Kansas Bar Associations and is licensed to practice in Nebraska. He is widely published in law reviews and in other agricultural law publications and conducts agricultural tax and law seminars across the country. Erica Eckley is the staff attorney at the Iowa State University Center for Agricultural Law and Taxation. She graduated from Drake University Law School where she was articles editor of the Agricultural Law Journal. She has also been an associate lawyer and a judicial law clerk in Iowa. She's a member of the Iowa State Bar Association and is admitted to practice in Iowa. Please note that you are able to ask questions during the presentation via the text chat on the left of your screen. As a reminder, the presentation today will be recorded and uploaded to the EBN course site if you want to review the talk at a later date. And at this time, I will turn the presentation over to Roger and Erica. Thank you very much and good evening everyone. Tonight our topic is going to be on immigration and the proper documentation that you need for your organization to ensure you comply with uh, federal law. And the federal law we're looking at is the Immigration and Nationality Act. In 1986, Congress reformed the U.S. immigration laws and sought to limit illegal entry in violation of the immigration law. And they provided employer sanctions within this law to ensure compliance with this. Typically, employment has been sort of a magnet that's attracted individuals to reside in the U.S. illegally. And the employer pro sanction provisions are seeking to prohibit the illegal work people working without the proper documentation without entering the country legally. To comply with the law, employers are required to verify identity and employment authorization, authorization for each person that they hire. And to do this, you complete a Form I-9. The bulk of our conversation this evening is going to be regarding the requirements for completing the Form I-9 proper documentation, various types of employment authorization and types of legal authorization for individuals such as U.S. citizens, non-citizen, nationals, lawful permanent residents, and aliens authorized to work. Note that also agricultural associations, agricultural employers, or farm labor contractors who hire, recruit, or refer for a fee an individual for employment in the United States are also required to uh, complete employment eligibility verification requirements. This is a specific uh, addition to these specific individuals for agriculture. Note that if employers fail to properly complete or retain or make available Form I-9s as required by law, there's federal civil penalties, and DHS looks at various things dealing with the employer in determining these penalties, such as business size, good faith of the employer, seriousness of the violation, whether or not the individual was an unauthorized alien, and history of previous violations of the employer. There's also issues of engaging in fraud or, or providing false statements using or misusing visas, immigration permits, and identity documents. And people who use fraudulent identification or employment authorization documents can be uh, fined or imprisoned by it for up to five years. It is important for employers to pay attention to this. They do have a good faith defense, which we're going to, to show you exactly how you can ensure that you are protecting yourself through this presentation. This good faith defense is that if you can show that you, in good faith, have complied with Form I-9 requirements, in res with respect to the charge of hiring an unauthorized alien, uh, then you can, um, a lot of these sanctions can be uh, waived against you uh, and can help you 
in uh, dealing with any kind of violation that might be found. A good faith attempt to comply with the paperwork may be adequate, um, even if there is some kind of technical or procedural failure on your part, as long as you work to correct those. Here in Iowa, there was a, a, a case that made a lot of news up in Postville. Uh, I'm not sure how far. I, I believe this went national in which we had uh, a packing plant that was hiring individuals who apparently were uh, not using proper documentation. They were unauthorized to work, were using perhaps even fraudulent, uh, fraudulently attained documents. And there were a lot of arrests um, made there. And pretty much it was the end of that business. I believe that the owner of that business is, uh, I, I believe they've sentenced him, and he's in a, a federal prison now. And a lot of the workers were detained and eventually removed from the country and, and unable to return. So it was a high-profile case um, in which the government wanted to show that they are taking these laws very seriously. And we have to look at the federal agencies. There's, there's the Homeland Security Act created one big executive department combining numerous federal agencies. And um, in 2003, what we used to know as INS, the Immigration and Nat Naturalization Service, became two, three new agencies within the Department of Hul Homeland Security who, who will deal with this. We have the US Citizenship and Immigration Services. And this is the agency that's responsible for most of the documentation of alien employment authorization. They deal with the I-9s, the E-Verify program we'll talk about later. There's the Customs and Border Protection, the U.S. Immigration and Customs, ICE. Yeah, this is the agency that did come into that Postville plant. Um, and uh, they, they're responsible for enforcement of penalty provisions. And then there's U.S. Department of Justice that can be um, retained. Uh, they've retained responsibility for anti-discrimination provisions. The biggest thing that you need to remember here is that while, while you uh, must ensure that everybody who works for you, who is employed by you, is authorized to, to work in this country, it is illegal to discriminate against anyone in your hiring, discharging, or recruiting because of their national origin or citizen status. Um, one thing that you ha must think about is as you're doing these I-9, there's various documents that people can provide to show that they are authorized to work and that they are who they say they are. As an employer, you cannot, absolutely cannot specify which documents they'll ex that you will accept. And you also cannot refuse to hire an individual simply because of the documents that they have presented might have a future expiration date. We'll go through um, all of these various things dealing with the Form I-9 and what these actually mean. But the anti-discrimination provision of the Immigration and Nationality Act um, specifically prohibits these four types of unlawful conduct, which would be the citizen or immigration status discrimination, national origin discrimination, unfair documentary practices, which are considered document abuse, or retaliation. So you're probably familiar with citizenship or immigration status, national origin, discrimination. These types of things are where you would treat a person differently based on a real or perceived citizenship or immigration status. And, and they're treated differently in respect to hiring, firing, or recruitment. The uh, national origin discrimination, that can be covered by the Department of Justice, but if you have a, a larger employer where there's more than 15 employees, this also would be covered by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and they would likely take any charges of national origin discrimination for those larger employees versus one of the uh, immigration agencies under the Department of Homeland Security. Document abuse um, occurs when employers treat individuals differently um, based on the documents that they provide. And this can be shown through improperly requesting that employees present any kind of a specific document, such as saying that I, I would like all of my employees to provide a United States citizen uh, passport, or I want everyone to provide a green card rather than um, allowing them to choose from the various uh, allowed documentation. 
also improperly rejecting documents if they appear to be genuine and they relate to the employee. You cannot um, reject a document merely because it has an expiration date. Also, improperly treating groups differently when they're completing a Form I-9, um, such as requiring certain groups to present particular documents merely because you believe they look or sound foreign, so you, you ask for additional documents or you ask for specific documents from those individuals. And retaliation occurs, um, this is also very serious, it occurs when there's some kind of intimidation, threatened you're threatening the employee with some kind of adverse action, you're coercing them, um, or otherwise just making things difficult for them uh, unreasonably because they have decided to assert rights under the, um, the Act's anti-discrimination provision. Either they filed a complaint or they've participated in an investigation. Okay, thank you, Erica. This is Roger, and we're going to continue on taking a look at the I-9 itself. So let's um, uh, get you into that form. You can find a, uh, an I-9 on the web uh, just by simply Googling Form I-9. Make sure you get the one for um, the, the United States and not some territory of the United States uh, because there are other ones that are out there. Um, <clears throat> And then we'll, we'll show a link later on where, where you can get this at. But um, the, the purpose of this document is to um, uh, show that each new employee, whether they're a citizen or a non-citizen, that's been hired after November 6, 1986, is actually authorized to work in the United States. And it's a very important form. I-9's been around for a long time. It's The form has basically been the same. Uh, the, the meat of it has been the same for many years. There have been tweaks that have been made to it, but uh, it's a very important important form, and as Erica pointed out, uh, Iowa has, has seen a couple of high-profile cases involving packing plants, slaughterhouses, and uh, one thing to keep in mind is enforcement of this can be selective, and it can uh, get political at times when the government wants to uh, have a high-profile uh, type situation. You've got to be on your toes. Uh, you, you don't want to be in violation of this, but particularly when you've got the federal agencies out there that are responsible for this that might be feeling heat from politicians, uh, then they'll look for a high-profile case to go go at and prosecute it. And that might, you know, there was some talk that that was from some of what was behind the pushing of a couple of the high-profile things in Iowa. Of course, Iowa uh, plays an important role in the uh, federal political scene with the First in the Nation caucuses and all of that. So, uh, and it is big in agriculture because of the use of uh, immigrant workers, uh, whether that's in the vegetable fields out in California, whether it's in Midwestern uh, packing, packing plants, but uh, it's very, very important. So this I-9, which has been around for quite some time, is just to make sure that we've got people that are working in the United States that are authorized to work here. Now, when should an I-9 be used? Well, uh, all, all employees, again, uh, have to complete this uh, if they've been hired after November 6, 1986, uh, and they're working in the U.S., they have to complete an I-9. Now, when we go section by section through the I-9, uh, we're going to, uh, Eric and I will, will alternate our discussion of these sections. So I'll take section one here. And in terms of uh, section one, and I'll show you what a, a copy of uh, a portion of section one looks like in just a moment on the slide, but this is the part of the form that has to be completed no later than the time of hire, which is the actual date of the beginning of employment. Whether you provide the social security number or not, that's voluntary, except those that are hired by employers that are participating in the uh, USCIS Electronic Employment Eligibility Verification Program, which is known as E-Verify, and, and we'll talk later about what the E-Verify program is. Uh, the employer is the party that's responsible for ensuring that Section 1 is timely and properly completed. So that is the employer's job, uh, to make sure that Section 1 is properly completed. Um, employers also need to note that the work authorization expiration date, if any, is shown in Section 1. So for employees who indicate an employment authorization expiration date in Section 1, the employers have to re-verify employment 
authorization for employment on or after the date that is shown on the form. Now, some employees may leave that expiration date blank if they are aliens whose work authorization does not expire. So if you've got refugees or certain citizens of uh, Micronesia or the Republic of the Marshall Islands, that's uh, what that pl applies to, and there are a few of those. Reverification for them does not apply unless they choose to present in, in Section 2 evidence of their employment authorization that contains the expiration date. So those are some, some key points uh, with respect to Section 1. One other thing we want to point out on, on Section 1 is if the employee can't complete Section 1, then a translator or preparer may be used. And what we mean by is, uh, in terms of being unable to complete it is basically a language barrier. So the preparer or translator certification has to be completed if section one is prepared by someone other than the employee. Now that preparer or translator may be used only when the employee is unable to complete section one on their own. The uh, employee, however, still has to sign section one personally. Uh, they have to sign their name even though they're not able to fill it out. Uh, they, it has to be pointed out where the, their signature is needed and they have to sign that. So here's what section one looks like. This is the I-9. If you just take a look at that briefly, it's not that complex, but uh, section one uh, shows you or gives you the anti-discrimination notice that, that Erica talked about a moment ago. Uh, you've got the employee verification uh, information that is contained there. Their name has to be put down, date of birth, social security number. Now uh, watch uh, the the use of the name. Now the way this is laid out it would be for standard uh, Anglo-Saxon names. What we run into, and we find this in other areas of the law, I particularly deal with this in, in the law of secured transactions when we're trying to uh, get security interest when somebody is borrowing money and we want to make sure that we're secure so we're taking an interest in their collateral. If your worker is Hispanic of origin, you've got to watch multiple the possibility for multiple surnames. That is very, very common. Make sure that the first part of uh, the, the section one of the I-9 is complete completed correctly. Uh, my experience has been on the secured transaction side of things. We've got a rule there that says that if you don't properly identify the debtor by using correct the exact name, exactly correct, uh, you will be unsecured. We've got a number of cases involving Hispanic debtors uh, where the all of the surnames were not used and sometimes they will even reverse the order and what we think uh, in Anglo-Saxon style is a surname may not actually be a surname. So just a note to yourself, double check that with respect to Hispanic origin workers to make sure that section one is completed absolutely correctly. And then you see the certifications that are contained there um, and there's the warning that federal law provides for imprisoner, imprisonment or fines for false statements and make sure that the appropriate boxes are checked there to the right on that lower part of section one. And then you also see the preparer or translator certification at the bottom part of section one. So that's what section one looks like. Let's move on to section two, Erica. Section two, again, I will be showing you what it looks like a little bit later, but let's just briefly talk about it. Section 2 is completed by the employer and this must be completed within three days of the employee's start date. So Section 1 has to be completed by the employee no later than the first day, uh, their first day of work. It can be completed prior to that after they have been accepted, after they have been offered and have accepted the job, but it must be completed on their first day. The employer must complete within three days of the start date this Section 2. If an employee is going to be employed for fewer than three days, then you have to complete it at, on the, the time of the start. So if an employee is only going to be there three days, make sure you get this done on the first day. Again, employers cannot specify which documents employees should present. So when you are giving the form I-9 to your employees to complete Section 1, you need to include the instructions and you need to include the list of documents that can be provided by the employee. We will show you what that list looks like a little bit later. But the employee must present original documents of either one document from List A or two documents one that would be from list B and one from list C. 
Sometimes you might have an individual who has lost or misplaced a document and they might provide a, a receipt in lieu of a document. This receipt cannot be an application for an initial grant of employment authorization or a renewal for authorization. This would be a situation where uh, somebody has misplaced their social security card, they didn't realize that they needed it, um, and then they, they come to, to work and, and discover that they don't have the social security card, so they go to Social Security Administration and get a receipt that they have applied for a, a new document there. You can terminate an employee who fails to produce the required documents or document or an acceptable receipt within three business days of the date that employment begins. It is the employer's responsibility to make sure this Section 2 is completed, and it has to be done within three days of the start date. So if an employee is unable to provide you documentation within these three days, you can terminate them for that. That is not discrimination. That is um, they are unable to show that they are authorized to work. Also, as an employer, you are required to examine the documents and if they appear reasonably genuine on their face, you must accept them. If you refuse to accept them and they reasonably appear to be genuine, that might be an unfair immigration-related employment practice, which can arise, can create a discrimination claim. If the documents do not reasonably appear on their face to be genuine, or if it, they do not relate to the person who presents them, you cannot accept them. So you are the gatekeeper to check these documents. There is a link in the, the um, materials on the website for these seminars that does have a link to a document that does provide a, a copy, a, a re, rep, reproduction of a lot of these documents. If you have some documents that you're not familiar with, that's a good place to go look to see exactly what those look at, to see what might be reasonably genuine. Also, a person's Social Security card or a receipt for replacement is acceptable, but it has to be the official Social Security card. It can't just be um, a notice from the Social Security Administration for how much they've put into the system or various things like that. Also, if you have a situation where you have a laminated Social Security card, you need to make sure that you check on the back that it does not say not valid if laminated, because if it does say that and it's laminated, then that would render the, the card invalid. If it's not signed, you can still accept it. Uh, metal or plastic reproductions are not permitted. Also, expired documents are no longer acceptable. Your documents have to either be still uh, within the, the date of expiration or have no expiration date on them to be acceptable. However, there are some employment authorization documents uh, and permanent resident cards that might, be, um, might appear to be expired on the face, but they've been extended by, um, by the the agency, um, temporary protected status beneficiaries would likely be, be individuals who provide a Form 17, I-7066, um, and that would be, uh, would appear to be expired, but you would have to check the Federal Register because they would provide extensions in that Federal Register for specific individuals within those classifications. Let's talk briefly about receipts. Receipts for a replacement of a lost, stolen, or damaged document um, can be provided and it's valid for 90 days from the date or higher or for re-verification. Um, they must, the employee must ultimately present an actual document for which the receipt was issued. So within 90 days from the time they present you with that receipt, they need to provide uh, the actual document that they did receive. There could be an arrival portion of a Form I-94, I-94A, containing a temporary I-551 stamp and a photograph. The uh, lawful permanent residents may have this. This would be a list A document, so they would not have to provide additional documents with that. And that would be valid until the expiration date of the stamp or one year from the date of issue. And then the employee would present an actual Form I-551, which is also a green card considered a you know, we, we call it a green card. Another one might be a departure portion of a Form I-94 with an unexpired refugee admission stamp. Um, this would be a List A document as well. It's valid for 90 days from the date or rehire. 
but they must ultimately present an unexpired Form I-766 or combination of, of list B documented unrestricted Social Security card. Note that um, on the re-verification, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but um, we're talking about receipts where they provide a receipt for a certain document and then they're showing that they did actually receive the document. Or we're talking about re-verification, they don't necessarily have to show you the same document. Um, they just have to show that they still have the author work authorization. So here's Form I-9, Section 2, and this is uh, the Employer Review and Verification. We have our List A documents, which you provide the document title, the issuing authority, the document number, if there's an expiration date, or you can do the List B and List C. Again, these must be original documents. The only exception would be a certified copy of a birth certificate. That would be acceptable, but again, a certified copy would likely have some kind of raised seal or other government um, uh, indicia of, of it being, uh, being official. You can use abbreviations in this, so if you have somebody who provides a, a driver's license, you could put DL for driver's license or Social Security for Social Security card in, in the document title. And then here we have our certification. Under the certification, the employer enters the date that employment began. So on this line, this blank line, month, day, year, you provide the date that the employment actually pe began. And then you sign it, print your name, your title, and your business organization and date. If you have another individual who is hired to, to do this documentation, or if you have a notary who is doing this, they would sign it and provide the, the business organization name as well. But again, it is the employer's responsibility, so if you do outsource this type of documentation, you, do, you are still responsible if something um, is not done correctly. Make sure that you include the document title, the issuing authority, document number, expiration date. If there is any, if there isn't one, just put N slash A for not applicable, the date the employment begins, and then you sign and date. Note you may photocopy these documents, the original documents that are provided, but in accordance with the discrimination issue, if you do photocopy documents, you need to make sure that your policy is to photocopy these documents for all new employees. And they may only be used for verification process. You cannot photocopy documents of just people that you're not sure if they're official. You can't just photocopy some documents um, and then you forget to do it for others. You need to make sure if you have a policy to f that you're going to photocopy documents that you photocopy for all new employees. Also, there's a lot of sensitive information on these documents and on the I-9. Um, you are required to retain copies of the I-9 for a period of time, and if you retain the photocopy documents of the original work authorization verification, you need to make sure that these are placed in a secure place and that you do keep this information uh, under lock and key so that somebody m doesn't get a hold of it. This is a list of acceptable documents. This list is within the instructions that are provided on the Form I-9. When you do provide the I-9 to your new employees, you need to make sure that you include the instructions and this list of acceptable documents. Again, it's imperative that you allow the employee to choose which documents to provide. If they provide something within List A, they only have to provide that one document because that document would establish both the identity of the individual and their employment authorization. So there's only one document to, um, to be provided there. If they choose to provide documents from List B, they also must provide a document from List C. List B only establishes identity of the individual. List C documents that they have the authorization to work within the United States. Note that if you do participate in the E-Verify 
you will be able to require that the LISP documents contain a photograph. E-Verify does have a photograph recognition, so you can make sure that you have the same um, person as the employment document that is provided to you. So you can require that LISP does include a photograph if you do participate in the E-Verify. And again, if you participate, all new employees have the same procedures. All new employees must provide uh, a photograph. One thing to keep in mind is that if you have a person, uh, an employee who's under the age of 18 that cannot present an identity document from list B, um, you can complete, you can still for, uh, complete a form I-9. You would have the parent or legal guardian complete section one for the minor, for the minor. And within the signature space, the parent or legal guardian would write the words individual under age 18, and then the parent or legal guardian provides the preparer translator certification. And then when you're filling out as the employer section 2 under the list B documents, you would, instead of putting a document under the title, you would put individual under age 18. And then you would record the list C document that the minor presents to show that they are authorized to work. Now, Roger's going to, to talk about updating and re-verification when you have an expired document. And that is the next section of uh, the I-9. Let me just show you what that looks like right now. This is section three, when you need to update and re-verify your information. This is for the employer, and the employer has to complete section three at, at any time that they update or re-verify the form I-9. Now, employers have to re-verify employment authorization of their employees on or before the work authorization expiration date that they put in Section 1 of the I-9 if there was a date that was actually put in Section 1. As an employer, you cannot specify which document they will, that you will accept from an employee. Now, uh, as you look at the various lines, or they call them actually blocks on the I-9, if an employee's name has changed at the time the form is being updated or re-verified, you do need to complete block A, the name block. If, a, if an employee gets rehired within three years of the date the form was originally completed and they're still authorized to be employed on the same basis as previously indicated on the form, then you have to complete block B and the signature block uh, also uh, on Section 3. Now, if an employee gets rehired within three years of the date that the form was originally completed and the employee's work authorization has expired, or if a current employee's work authorization is about to expire, that's known as re-verification, then what you do as the employer is go ahead and complete Block B and then look at any document that reflects the employee is authorized to work in the United States, and that's the list from A or C. So let me just back up to the list that Erica had up here uh, just a moment ago. So in that situation, you take a look at the document that reflects the employee is authorized to work in the United States, and that's going to be from A or C. Now, normally, uh, most of the situations, what you're working off of list A will be the U.S. passport or the passport card or permanent resident card or alien registration receipt card. That's where uh, we would expect most of this um, most of what you would be dealing with would be one of those. List C, of course, the Social Security account number card uh, or the certification of birth abroad that's been issued by the Department of State. So those are going to be your, your big ones primarily that will, I would say are going to be you know, three-fourths of the time those are going to cover what you need. So those are the lists that apply when we're dealing with re-verification on Section 3. And then secondly, after you've examined the document that reflects that the employee is authorized to work in the United States off of that A list or that C list, then record the document title, the document number, and the expiration date in Block C. Uh, of Section 3 and then complete the signature block. Now for the re-verification purposes, you as an employer have the option of completing a new Form I-9 instead of completing Section 3. So if you don't want to do the Section 3 stuff, then just complete a brand new uh, Form I-9. Now, is there a filing fee associated with this? No, there's no filing fee associated with uh, completing the I-9. It's not filed with the uh, with any federal agency, it's not filed uh, with the 
USCIS or any or any government agency for that matter, the I-9 has to be retained by the employer. So the employer, as the employer, you have to hang on to this, and you have to make it available upon request for inspection by the U.S. government officials as specified in the Privacy Act notice, uh, which is also contained in the uh, I-9. So. Um, those are your requirements. You don't have to file this thing. You've got to keep get it filled out properly. If you need to re-verify, you need to do that. Complete Section 3. If you don't want to do that, then just uh, have a new Form I-9 on file and make it available for inspection if you're requested by a government agency. Now, uh, Eric is going to move. Well, before we move into that, I want to just point out that we do have the website on here where you can download the forms uh, to obtain the I-9. It's the USCIS.gov slash forms, and all the forms that you're going to need for purposes of employees uh, can be obtained off that website. You can get blank forms there. Uh, remember some of these forms. Uh, watch your copying. Make sure you're getting both sides that are copied, and they have instructions with them. And watch your retention date. Uh, make sure you retain these for three years after the date of hire or one year after employment ends, whichever of those is later. That's the key. Those are the key points with respect to completion of the I-9. What Eric is going to talk about next is the E-Verify system. This is a very important um, uh, discussion. Uh, so uh, we'll turn it back over to Erica to cover E-Verify for you. E-Verify is a system set up by the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. For the most part, it's voluntary right now. And what this does is it compares the information an employee provides on a Form I-9 against government records and generally provides a result in three to five seconds to the employer. So if you're worried that you might have employees who would be coming in and you're not uh, sure if the documents are genuine, you, you might consider enrolling in the E-Verify because if there is a mismatch, E-Verify will alert the employer uh, and the employee will be allowed to work while they resolve the problem. But if they do determine that they are not eligible to work, then um, the, then you would notice you would have notice of that and be able to take measures for that. So it, it basically works by comparing information um, with Social Security Administration records, so you have your Social Security numbers that are provided, it can verify that. It also has U.S. Department of Homeland Security records. The database uh, for Homeland Security contains records about employment-based visas, immigration and naturalization status, U.S. passports, and it uses E-Verify to compare information against a wide variety of sources to ensure that the documentation that you have received from the employee is genuine and the work authorization is valid. But you still have to complete the I-9. You have to complete the I-9 first and you have to follow all the rules um, that, you, that we just talked about for completing the I-9 before E-Verify. But there are two exceptions. One is that employees must provide their social security numbers for on the I-9 if, if you are participating in E-Verify. And any list B documents that you receive from the individual must contain a photo. So once the I-9 is completed and you have a social security number and you have a photograph, uh, a document with a photograph of the individual, you enter the information into the E-Verify system. And depending on the documents that the employee provides, you, you may have to compare a photo displayed on the computer screen to the photo on their document. It, the photo should match. Um, if they do, that ensures the photo, document photo is genuine and hasn't been altered. And um, and also it would compare social security numbers if, if they have those uh, to make sure that uh, it does match the other information. Note that you cannot um, ask an employee to provide a specific document with his or her social security number on it. That could constitute unlawful discrimination. You, they just have to provide the number. And if you decide that you want to enroll in the E-Verify, you can go to their enrollment website. Um, they'll have uh, the terms of agreement, you can read through those. Uh, 
you can look through the enrollment checklist to make sure that you have the capability to participate, you have the, the technological um, requirements, various things like that that can get you. And you can just begin e-verify enrollment. Notice, note though that if you do choose to participate in e-verify, like everything else we've discussed today, it does need to be uh, used for all new employees. You can't just pick and choose which employees will go through the e-verify system. Also, e-verify is only used after an employee has been uh, offered the position and hired and they have started and you have completed the Form I-9. They can't, ju you can't just call and, and verify uh, somebody that you're considering whether or not their documentation is correct. You have, this is actually just a, a way to verify that the Form I-9 information is correct and the person is authorized to work. Now we're going to go through the different classifications of workers that you might come up, uh, you might encounter. The, the first one is U.S. citizen and non-citizen nationals. Um, these are, are people who would never need re-verification due to, to their status. They are authorized to work permanently um, in the United States. We have a question of what if we have an Amish employee and they don't take pictures? Um, I'm sure that there is, um, I, I'm not familiar exactly what the what there is, but I do know with, with Amish and various religious uh, institutions, when you do have situations like that, the, the federal government um, does does provide for for ways to, to deal with that, but I, I'm not familiar right offhand with the Amish. That would be probably a, a good question to, to present s uh, straight to the department um, for that. A lawful permanent resident, um, this person may, but again, they do not have to present a Form I-551. There can be different expiration dates on this. There could be a 10-year expiration, no expiration date, two years, um, or there could be an expired card with a notice of action that would be re-verified. Foreign passports with a, a stamp re-verifying when the stamp expires. Um, there's also the Form I-94 with an unexpired stamp and photograph. Um, that would be a valid list A receipt. And then again, you need to verify when the permanent resident card is received. Note that the worker may use other forms of identification. Just because they're a lawful permanent resident does not mean that they have to provide a green card. They can choose from the list of A, B, and C documents what documents they actually provide to show that they are authorized to work. Another class of documents that are workers that you might come in contact with are refugees and asylees. They are authorized to work because of their immigration status. And on the Form I-9, when they fill out the Section 1, you want to make sure that they indicate that they are alien authorized to work. And these individuals may present, um, again, they don't have to. Um, they can present any documents they want. They may present an unexpired employment authorization document, which is referred to as a Form I-766. There would be no expiration date, so there would be no re-verification. Again, they can provide other documents within that list. Um, you cannot tell them which ones they will provide. Another type of worker that you might run into is the temporary protected status. This is basically a temporary immigration benefit that allows uh, individuals from designated countries to be here for a limited time. They could have a, a Form I-766 employment authorization document. This may have an expiration date on it, um, but again, this, this is a situation where the Department of Homeland Security may issue a notice of extension in the Federal Register, so if they have an exp expiration date that looks like it has expired, um, they would you would need to make sure that you check the Federal Register to find out if these particular people um, are, have been extended through the Department of Homeland Security action. And there, the notice of extension can be found um, on the, the agency's website under uh, USCIS.gov slash TPS for temporary protected status. So if you have a situation where you have a worker with one of these documents, 
you might check that website to, to find out if their work authorization has been extended. Exchange visitors, these are considered J1, and they come to the U.S. for a specific period of time. They're participating in a particular program, and it would be stated on their form. And they would have specific, specific authorization for a specific job. These individuals may offer you the foreign passport, and it would have a form one I-94, I-94A number and an expiration date, or a DS-2019 number and expiration date. Uh, if they are a student, they might be authorized for on-campus employment. Status could be extended, but you will need to verify with the officer who uh, the number would be on the DS-2019. Dependents of these individuals are listed as J2 and can only work, only are authorized to work if they actually have their own Form 1 I-766. So if you have a J2, uh, you need to make sure that they do actually have authorization to work. Finally, we have the F1, M1 non-immigrant students. These are foreign students who are participating in academic studies or language training. They may be eligible to work on campus uh, if there's a particular practical training for their curriculum. Off-campus employment if they have shown that there would be a severe economic hardship if they are not allowed to work or employment sponsored by an international organization and some kind of optional practical training. So they, their ability to work is limited. There might also be foreign students pursuing non-academic or vocational studies, and they may only accept employment if, part of, if it's part of their practical training program or uh, for a short period of time after completion of the course of study. So these documents would have restrictions on the work authorization of these individuals. Dependents of these individuals would be designated as F2 or M2, and these people are not eligible to work in the United States. So if you have an F2 or M2, that individual will not have any work authorization and cannot be employed legally in the United States. Okay, we're going to move on to a uh, discussion of H-2A uh, temporary ag and workers and temporary ag workers in the United States. And this is a program that allows U.S. employers or its agents that meet uh, certain regulatory requirements to be able to bring foreign nationals into the United States to fill temporary ag jobs. And it's very important in the agricultural industry uh, in terms of having access to temporary ag workers from abroad. Now, a U.S. employer or a U.S. agent that's an uh, agency or agent that's described in the regulations or an association of U.S. ag producers named as a joint employer, they're going to have to file a Form I-129. And that's mentioned uh, later on in about the fifth bullet point down on this slide. So if you've got multiple workers, you file an I-129 requesting the H-2A status. Uh, on a prospective worker's behalf. Now, who qualifies for H-2A classification? Well, in order to qualify for H-2A non-immigrant classification, then the party that is uh, trying to seek qualification must offer a job that's of a temporary or seasonal nature, of course, and demonstrate that there aren't sufficient U.S. workers who are able and willing and qualified and available to do the temporary work at hand. And you also have to show that the employment of H-2A workers would not adversely affect the wages and working conditions of those U.S. workers that would be similarly employed. And then generally submit with the H-2A petition a single valid temporary labor certification from the United States Department of Labor. There are some exceptions to that requirement, uh, but those are the basic rules with respect to who can qualify for H-2A classification. The um, a couple of other things to keep in mind with respect to H-2As, uh, you use this for the I-94, the I-94A, it has an expiration date on it, you can extend the status of this in one-year increments, uh, a year at a time. 
and it needs to be filed well before the expiration of the worker's status, and that's a key point. Uh, you need to write 240-day extension and your date submitted uh, with the Form I-129 to the USCIS in Section 2. That will allow the worker to continue to work up to 240 days while the petition is processing or until it is denied. And then re go back and re-verify that information in Section 3 once a decision is received. Now typically your H-2A workers cannot begin working for a new employer until a petition gets approved. E-Verify employers that Erica talked about can employ new H-2A workers as soon as the I-129 petition is filed on their behalf and they're allowed to work for 120 days or until the petition is denied. One other thing I want to add into the discussion here is a tax issue. I suppose the the uh, discussion tonight would not be complete unless we drew tax in here uh, somehow, but there was an issue that arose uh, with the IRS a couple of years ago, and it's still an issue that's out there. We, we want to make sure people are clear on this, so you might want to just uh, take note of this. This is going to have uh, significant application to the vast majority of, of you, but uh, of course these foreign ag workers that are temporarily admitted in the United States on H-2A visas, are the key point I want to get across to you is that they are exempt from U.S. Social Security and Medicare taxes on compensation that you pay to them for services performed in connection with the H-2A visa. They're generally not subject to self-employment tax either. So that is a very, very uh, important point. Their compensation is not considered to be wages for purposes of federal income tax withholding. It's not subject to mandatory income tax withholding uh, unless backup withholding applies, of course. But uh, what you're going to do on these people is you're going to report compensation of $600 or more that's paid to foreign ag workers who entered the country on H-2A visas in Box 1 of Form W-2. But you don't report it as Social Security wages in Box 3 or Medicare wages in Box 5 on the W-2 because their compensation that's performed in connection with the H-2A visa is not subject to Social Security and Medicare taxes. That gets screwed up all the time. Uh, we try, we've been trying to get the word out on this for the past couple of years to report this properly on the W-2. We talked about W-2s a week or two ago, and this is uh, something that's different for these foreign ag workers that are temporarily here on these H-2A visas. They, they do not have compensation. Uh, that is subject to Medicare tax or U.S. Social Security tax. It's not subject to, it's not wages for purposes of federal income tax withholding. So you don't have the mandatory income tax withholding unless that backup withholding applies, as I said earlier. So on that W-2, do not check box 13. That's the statutory employee box as an H-2A. These H-2A workers are not statutory employees. And I believe it was the very first uh, evening that we had about three weeks ago where we talked about statutory employees. H-2A workers are not statutory employees. So the employer is not required to withhold federal income tax from compensation that you're going to pay the H-2A worker for ag labor performed in connection with the visa unless the worker asks for withholding and the employer agrees. Of course, you, you can always do that. But in that case, then the worker gives the employer a completed W-4, uh, and, that's, and then you are going to withhold federal income tax uh, and report the amount withheld in box two of the form W-2. So those reporting rules apply when the H-2A worker provides their taxpayer ID number to the employer. Uh, and uh, if you're looking for rules relating to backup withholding and reporting when the H-2A worker does not provide a taxpayer ID number, then you want to look to the instructions on the 1099 miscellaneous as well as the instructions for the 945. But just to make sure you're clear on this, to drive the point home, these foreign ag workers that are here temporarily uh, admitted to the U.S. on H-2A visas are exempt from U.S. Social Security and Medicare taxes on payments for services that they perform under the H-2A visa. And that is a key point. Uh, and make sure you're completing that W-2 properly. Now, um, one of the things uh, we do thank you for your attention. Uh, one of the items that, with respect to that Amish question that came up just a moment ago, 
really uh, what you're looking at there would be uh, we'd have to get dig into an analysis of case law involving religious discrimination and there are there have been uh, over the decades a number of cases involving the Amish uh, with respect to various issues whether it's slow moving vehicle signs on buggies whether it's uh, reflective tape that can be required whether it's mandatory compulsory education uh, how that how that applies to uh, Amish that uh, that would have uh, their religious convictions violated if they were subject to that, or the requirement to get a Social Security uh, card. We would we would need to research that. That's an excellent question, uh, but frankly, that's a question that we don't ever get, and so we haven't looked at that. Um, if you'd like to follow up with that on. Uh, if you'd like to have us follow up on that with you, uh, feel free to drop us an email. But we do thank you for allowing us to be with you the past uh, three weeks in these four sessions. Uh, we've enjoyed it uh, immensely, and hopefully you've, you have found, found it useful to be with us. Uh, pay attention to the website. There's a lot of information there for you on the website. We have a lot of resources that we can point you to. If they're not on the website, uh, we can probably get you pointed in the right direction. But uh, I guess we do have maybe just a few minutes uh, for questions, if there are any questions. And I, I see, okay. Uh, okay, that's a, Karen asked a question for the uh, administrators here, not one for us, and Gwen is answering that. Erica, is there anything else you want to add at this point in time? Um, at this time, I just want to thank you all for your attention. Um, I also want to clarify on the Social Security number, it's only on the Form I-9. You can't um, require them to provide the Social Security number unless you're in the E-Verify. There is a case law regarding the requirement to provide a Social Security number, you know, once they start working for tax and other purposes that in that regard. I was just... Uh, Regarding the Form I-9, the Social Security number cannot be required except for the E-Verify situation. And so I'm going to, uh, if there are no other questions, I'm going to pass it back over to our hosts. Thank you very much and have a nice evening. Thank you, Roger and Erica, for your presentation this evening. And thanks to all of you for your participation. Tonight's presentation was the fourth webcast in a five-part series. Next week, we'll, we will be having a webcast on best practices for a safe and efficient facility presented by Karen Waite of Michigan State University. You will receive a survey by email after the final webcast on March 7th, and we hope you'll take a few minutes to give us your feedback for the Equine Business Network webcast you've attended. It will help us to better serve you. The quiz and certificate for week three is now available in the course site. The quiz and certificate for week four will be available early next week as we need to create the questions based on the presentation this evening. Join the Equine Business Network on Facebook, Twitter, and on our blog for the most up-to-date information on our events, courses, and more. This webcast was recorded, and again, it will be uploaded to the EBN course site. Feel free to send us your comments and suggestions to info at myhorseuniversity.com. Thanks, and we hope you all have a great night.